Welcome everyone to Fish Easy at 411. Yes, fish room information. I appreciate everybody uh, coming to check out the, the room. We'll give people a chance, uh, chance to come in. Uh, chance, uh, chance, uh, Hold on. There we go. Little echo going on here. We're still working out the details. But uh, while we're expecting more and more people to come in, I uh, just wanted to make a few mentions. For example, if you're watching the replay, in this case, you're um, part of the replay crew, so please leave a comment down below. It would be nice to see who is actually seeing uh, the replay. In today's episode, this Saturday, today, we're going to uh, take a good look at some feeding of small fry because it's a continuation of what we discussed last week concerning the um, breeding of German blue rams because it seems as though throughout the week I've had a lot of questions, a lot of people who have come in and everybody wants to know a few more things about how to get the blue rams to, to eat, to be fed and that is that in itself is very important. So. Um, I'm going to cover that in depth and I thought to myself you know it would be really great if I could cover all the live foods that I have in this fish room and why I feel that each and every one of them is ideal or, or shall we say um, imperative to have you know something that is vital for the fish room but as it turns out um, I, I don't find that the fish room uh, um, time allotted for this particular live episode is, is enough to cover all the basics. So what I'm going to do is uh, feature and specifically talk about the feeding of very small fry and that is probably one of the hardest things to do and then go from there. So uh, again welcome to Fish Easy everyone. Uh, thank you Lazarus the Fish Boy. Uh, Nonstop Aquatics is here. I'm glad you're here, Nonstop. Uh, Jonathan has been um, uh, asking me a lot of questions this week, so I think that's that's super important because um, that way I can answer a few of those uh, issues that came up during the week. And I know if you have questions, it means that everyone has questions. That's always the case. So here I am. I'm thinking about uh, also what we're going to cover today is simply a quick look at the discus tank. I think it's quite interesting and we're also going to take a look at a surprise first spawning this week and uh, this is going to be awesome because for us what it means is that I've got another um, lengthy uh, learning curve to bring up these uh, fry. Now I will say that these fry are catfish. Now. We'll take a closer look in a few minutes, but uh, maybe if you hang in there, you'll get to see some um, very small young catfish, and they're not corridors. And I know that you're probably thinking, because I do did mention I have corridors, and I do, I don't think I've mentioned about this particular fish. I, I counted up one day how many species in these 30 tanks I have, and it turns out that I have how many how many species? It looks like it's as, almost as many as tanks. It was like unbelievable. I'm like, I really have that many species? I mean, where, where am I putting all these fish? But um, that's, that's collectoritis or is that something that happens when people just love fish? Well, uh, here's a quick look at what I'm staring at. Behind me, of course, is the nursery. And then if I just take a quick peek around on the other side, what I've been doing this week, let's see if I can remember how to turn the camera around. I don't remember how to do that. Oh, there it is. It changes in its position. Now here's the, here's the workbench. I've got the last week, those three tanks, I think on the right were empty. Now they're lined up with fish that are uh, posed for sale. I've had orders uh, through my Kijiji lat ads and if anybody wants to see what I'm offering at the moment they can always go to barbs.ca b-a-r-b-z dot c-a that's b-a-r-b-z dot c-a for you Canadians now 
noting on the right I've got several patches or groups of several groups of um, Odessa barbs and they're going out this week so some are being picked up tomorrow I've been uh, sorting them through and also I promised this last week uh, a quick look at that leftmost tank that leftmost tank was the breeding project from last week in fact why don't we just zoom in there right now and take a quick look um, this this tank has baby um, uh, fry there's some they're already boy they're already 10 days old they're close to over 10 days old and you can see how big they are you put in some baby brine shrimp and their bellies get really large there's one in the bushes there I gather and they're usually hanging out in the back okay look in the back corner way in the back there I don't know if you can see them but they hang out there uh, it's too blurry not enough light oh there they are see there's a few you see them hanging out there they're full bellied um, Odessa barbs only 10 days old and those uh, those fish in particular are um, um, spawned this year every year I spawn them and uh, the reason I spawned them in this particular set of uh, uh, parameters is because there's some experiments going on with Odessa barbs I've been working with Greg Sage and uh, Greg Sage in Colorado if anybody uh, knows him he is uh, well known for his Odessa barbs that's where mine came from and we've been in communicado been to talking about this and I think one of the things that um, uh, I'm trying to attempt is to change the sex ratio of Odessa's so when you spawn them, do you get 50% out or do you get 50% males and females or do you get more males than females if you use a certain parameter of water conditions? Now that's a little experiment that down the road it'll take a year before this particular spawn, um, maybe eight months before this spawn I can take a good look at them and see. But it's interesting that the phenomena occurred to me when uh, in one particular year, that was 2020, I raised over a thousand fish. And of those thousand fish, every one of them was male. Now, they were from different, they were from different parents. They were um, sometimes one pair and the other groups were sometimes multiple pairs put into the uh, spawning tank. We'll, we'll have to do an episode on how to breed uh, barbs and uh, that will be in the future but in this particular case uh, there must have been something environmental to cause that you just that it's it's just um, beyond me I just can't understand I can't fathom any possibility of uh, how it's possible that there could be some um, actual genetic way of of this occurring when this year, this 2021, it was closer to 50%. So something was different between the two years. And now I'm trying to get back to how I did it back then to find out how it's possible. And of course, the ultimate reason is, is obvious. If you raise a thousand fish and only half of them are sellable, then you could really increase your, your production by just not breeding any females, if you knew how to do it. I don't know. If there's a if there's a special way or something, but stay tuned. And maybe um, we'll learn it together. So now back to the basics or the the amounts at hand. What I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss today. If we want to, first of all, I didn't. I'm not able to bring up the chat. I have yet to figure out how on this thing to bring up the chat. Oh wait a minute. Okay, that helps. Click the chat button. Unbelievable. <sighs> so, well, that brings it up, but I don't know if there's anything there. Um, okay, so questions uh, can be pouring in. Uh, uh, temperature. Well, temperature is definitely something that is the key. I am attempting to try to breed the fish at a little higher temperature than I have been. Greg Sage always uses approximately 78, and I'm sure if he's online, hi Greg, if 
you're online, then certainly you can uh, always uh, put in the chat a uh, comment or two. But that's what they normally breed at. But I think in the past I have bred them a little higher temperature. And so at 82 degrees or 84, somewhere in there. But they don't always breed, so you, you can't always get a successful spawn. And I'm trying to make it so that I get a successful spawn and uh, at the same time not just get a successful spawn but it would be nice if uh, whatever I get they turn out to be um, all males then I can do a spawn that's all males and then when I need females I can just do a you know tweak the numbers and come out with less so don't know how that is left side of the screen okay I'll try touching that way to get the comments to come up it seems to be done and let's see, uh, any other questions I missed? Um, yes, Greg is with us. Thank you, Greg. So, um, just since Greg is here, I just want to mention uh, something about the um, um, spawning of the Odessa barbs. They too are a super, you know, super small fry. Uh, I don't know which is smaller. I think the Odessa barbs are even smaller than the uh, the German blue rams. I think there's no question that they're much smaller. When they come out of the egg, they look nothing different than a sliver of glass on the side of the tank. You don't even see a mouth. You, you can't possibly see one. You don't even figure it's a fish. It even looks like a, something else. But uh, they quickly transform and that's when they're able to eat. So I use paramecium. And paramecium I started using, uh, originally when I first started breeding fish, I didn't have the paramecia available. And so I started using um, powdered microfoods, and that worked, that worked. Um, but I also found that it seems the fish respond better, they go better, they imme immediately uh, take to the live foods because of course they're swimming in the water column and they're swimming in the water column. and and if they don't see a, a dropping piece of um, dry food just happen to go in front of them for them to think that it's moving in the bite, I think that they're missing a lot of that food. So that's one of the reasons why live feeding is so important. And the food is something that um, is good. Now, Moina, uh, Jason Holmes. Welcome, Jason. Jason asks about Moina. I also have that in the fish room. But believe it or not, they're too big very small but they're too big but what I've done is when I take the parents out and there's just eggs in the tank I put Moina in the tank because the Moina can survive in fresh water if you put vinegar eels in a tank they don't survive after so many hours but the Moina can continue to, to stay and breed and even continue to, to blossom in the tank and then as the fry grow larger, eventually they start eating the moina, and, which is a small daphnia. And the daphnia just eventually disappear. So that's one way of doing it. I have done it that way. And uh, we're going to get into the, my cultures and how it is. But my paramecia originally came from Greg Sage. And I got him a, a start from him. And this, what I can remember, was that if I just want to repeat what he said, it was... Uh, in, a, a source, I, maybe it was Florida or somewhere, but it was a source where uh, this was being propagated for um, college type campus and laboratory biology and so they, they had it down to a science. So how to reproduce them, how to culture them, this was all done and figured out. And I know many people have different methods and you could go out on the internet and you can search Infusoria and Infusoria and Infusoria and you get all kinds of these videos and everybody has their way of doing it and you take broccoli and you take other pieces of vegetable and you put it into a rotten molten mixture and after three days you'll have Infusoria well you'll also have a strong smell and and I learned that from uh, I think it was Mark's Aquatics in Wales and he was he was uh, really educational and I really enjoy watching Mark's videos that's shout out to Mark but um, I've always wondered well could could you do similar or the same thing without the smell or odor 
could you do something that wasn't so I mean this is a 100 foot square fish room and I'm kind of enclosed here and I want to put something that's rotting and smell bad and even Mark puts it near the window where it can you know get some air <laughs> um, the method that was devised by the college and the recipe I was given came from Great Sage, which came from that source. And that's why uh, I go with it, because it's been proven, and this is why. It uses hard berries. I have a bag of it. I show it on my video. If you go back and watch my video on um, I'm using this, this is actually what I buy. I don't need a whole bag. I need about six kernels per batch, six kernels. And what's worse is when I bought this from Amazon, it came as a two, I had to buy it in a two package form. In other words, it came as two packages, so I had two of these. But it's hard wheat, basically. Now it's called hard wheat berries because it's referring to the, the wheat kernels as a berry and this is used and you can cook it my wife has even taken this and made some salads you uh, cook it down and made some wheat berry uh, salad and that works um, but you have to buy a lot of this so I, I I feel sad because it's it's so much expense but it's not that expensive it's just I end up buying a lot so I when I send out a uh, sample or a culture start for the Paramecia, I always include a supply of this because that's all you need. That, water, and brewer's yeast. Now, for the brewer's yeast, um, th this is what I do. Above me, you can see actually above, I have these bottles right here. I don't know if you can see them. There's, they're numbered. They're numbered 1, 10, and 20. Now, from the time of my original video, there's been some changes on that only that I've honed in or I've perfected the, 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 the process because you know as you get experience you keep doing it better and you keep doing better you try this and you try that and you find out a lot of things first of all for example does adding more brewers yeast yield a thicker production the answer is no actually it harms the production okay um, does it matter what water you use? Do you need to use RO water? Answer, no. Basic tap water is fine. Um, how many berries do you put into the, uh, you know, is it, do I add more? Like uh, if I put in a tablespoon of uh, these hard berries, these hard wheat berries? No, don't, don't put that many. I put um, just six kernels at the max six maybe five kernels why my experience has been as I'm cultivating these uh, I've got a couple here I'm going to just take one here this is um, this is one I'm using now 20 it's a it's a 20 which, which means to me what I do is I just mark it so that this was this was produced on the 20th of the month so this is going on the 20th of last month today's today's the 11th so this one is not quite four weeks old this one is in prime and it, i think i showed you last week uh, the amount of the amount of paramecia you could see it's thick it's like maximized it's got the maximum concentration so i can put in and this is the key this is important because if i put in a whole baster in a small container such as this See here, this, the smaller container means the higher the concentration of the water. Now, the negative side of paramecium is the water. The water's, shall we say, um, what's, what's the, the word? Putrefying. The water is putrefying. It's creating bacteria, and that's what the paramecia are eating. They're not eating the wheat berries. The wheat berries provides the starch, provides the amount of uh, uh, food source for the bacteria. 
and the bacteria is ever present. So you get that from when you start the new new because I'll take one baster or two baster fulls and put it into the new start culture. I'll take one of these one and a half liter bottles, fill it up with water, put in my boiled berries. I boil them for 12 minutes, only five or six. So you take a cup of water and uh, I just use a container on the stove, any pan will do. You take, um, here I have one, just like this. I just put a cup, a cup of water, maybe two cups, it doesn't really matter, two cups because I'm gonna use all the water I use in this in the culture. So I just put a cup of water, five or six berries, set it on the stove, boil it for 12 minutes, and then take it off the heat and let it cool down to room temperature. Now, warning, always, always use a timer because you will forget and one cup of bo boiling water won't last very long and you'll have smoke, burnt berries in a bottle and that's what happens to me a few times. So you learn from my experience. Always set a timer. Beep, 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 but not only just beep, 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 maybe you won't hear it. So not in the kitchen, but in the fish room <laughs> as well. So you, you get the, the berries, you put that in the container, and that's it. Take some starter, two, two basterfuls into the starter, and then on the outside of the container, mark it what day of the month. Is it the 1st, the 10th, or the 20th? That's the 1, 10, and 20. So I use two bottles at a time. Two bottles on the 1st, two bottles on the 10th, and two bottles on the 20th. And you know why? <laughs> <laughs> Smoke alarms are indeed timers, you're right. <laughs> Unfortunately, once that happens, I have to boil them again, and so I always dread doing that. So, the, the advantage is, of course, when you have the bottle, and it's, there's two of them, if for any reason one of them doesn't produce as well as the other one, you can just use the one. Or, there's the other option, somebody needs paramecium they're, 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 they've got better fish and they call me up and they say hey you still got that I said yeah I say yeah you can have a whole culture it's ready to go right now because I always have some right now and then they'll drive over from the other side of Toronto and to get this because their little beta fish need some food and that's what they'll do now also nonstop aquatics is asking a very good question at this time it's an appropriate Time to answer it. How long till I know I messed up my culture? When you first put it in, let's look at uh, what the last one I did, which is on the first, and I'm going to make a new culture today, right? So I haven't even looked at these. This is the one done on the first, and I'm looking at it, and already this one is full. This one I can already, after 10 days, I can already start using it to feed. But I know it'll last another 10 days. So on the 20th, it will, another 10 days from now, um, this one is the one I'll be using. So I, I'll wait another 10 days for this one. But I also know that the last one I'm using up right now, since I'm making some, this one, the 20th, as I mentioned a minute ago, this one's about to be used up. Not just that there's no more paramecia in there, but it's that they'll start to die off because the culture gets imbalanced and they'll start to die off and pretty soon you'll find there's just a little bit of paramecia for the amount of water that's in the in the baster so I'm thinking in terms I want to put in the least amount of water sometimes on these these depending on how big the fish are and when I'm going to be feeding them these particular size containers uh, I won't put a full baster. I might put just a quarter baster. And that's because there's only a few fry in there or because I don't want to cloud the water because it's not it's not going through the system. I have to it's like a self-container. These over here are not connected to a tank. This one is in fact um, I have to change the water every day. You know, I change 50% of the water after they've been been feeding. So you'll know if the, the t culture's taking off, John, nonstop aquatics, you'll know that it's in, in maybe four or five days. You'll start to see it. You'll start to see a concentration of them going. And maybe if this is your very first time, you're not starting with more 
than I started with because I'm taking two basterfuls from the previous culture just to start mine. I'm using a lot of start, in other words, to get it really uh, going. So your first time of using maybe a little bit of culture, it might take longer to get up to maximum. Therefore, be careful, and that's what I was going to mention about the too many berries. What happens is they rot, and so they produce, I think, this is the oldest one. I don't know if at the bottom you can see the muck. Do you see the muck? See that muck right there? I avoid putting that in my tank. I try to avoid that. So I'm taking the baster and I'm pu pulling from this area up at the top. And at the bottom, I leave the muck. That's just rotting material. And now, here's an example. And here's an example. I've gotten to the bottom. I've gotten this much. I've used this much. And I'm at the bottom a few inches. I went to the second bottle because I, there's no need to keep trying to sap it out of here. When I get to this low, I just toss it. That's why another advantage of having two bottles of a culture. But the berries continue to rot and they produce that muck. And so let me ask you this. Is it not obvious that if you put in 15, 20, maybe a whole tablespoon of berries, you'll have a, a hundred times more muck? <laughs> the answer is yes, and you don't need it. So putting in a limited amount of berries is perfect so that you don't have too much rotting going on. So it's just the right amount. So I've, I've tried um, less, I've tried more, and it seems like I get a half a dozen berries, hard berries, is all you need. So, how much time does that take me? A lot of people I've heard, I've heard this comment, oh, you know, it's a lot of work, I keep going, keep multiplying, and so forth. You get in a routine, and you're doing this once every 10 days, and you're watching the calendar. Oh, it's the 10th. Oh, it's the 20th. Oh, you can set a timer on your calendar. Boom. You know, it's the time. I walk in there, I do it, and I'm processing while I'm doing other things. It's just one more little task. And then I would say overall the whole time amount of my efforts actually doing it amounts to what? less than 10 minutes, probably closer to 5 total time. Because you get a custom, you know what you're doing. 5 minutes, maybe 10 days, and then that's it. And I have at my disposal. Now there's times when I don't have fry, and I don't have fry. No worries. They're there, they're ready. They're ready for somebody to purchase if they need it. But they're ready for a fry, a surprise spawn. That happens from time to time. And if there's a surprise spawn, then obviously this is something that that is right there, ready to go. I don't have to, oh, I have, I have, I have a spawn. I need to start a culture. Oh no, it's gonna take 10 days before, 20 days before it's peaked. You know, so to me, the five minutes is worth it, you know, and I just keep rotating the bottles. And uh, so I've used, I have the three sets, the first, the 10th and the 20th, and that's all I use. So I hope that this explanation on using the paramecia is been helpful. I hope that it helps a lot of people um, from, um, you know, having, you know, a lot of mishaps when, when, German blue babies, for example, German blue fry are so small. Um, there's going to be two periods in which the transition um, will account for a lot of your losses. The first transition is th at the time of hatch. I'm going to show you a few things. If I just go over here and we're going to examine a few of these, these tanks. Now, here, for example, these fry hatched out I was expecting it Tuesday. These are uh, electric blue rams, and these are not off the bottom. They're moving. They're not just wiggling, but they're moving. I'm expecting these to be fully in the water column by tomorrow. So far, they've been hatched close to four days, 
and these have not received a single piece of food just clean water nothing else now at the same time this is uh, one day younger but these are German blues notice that they're not at that stage where they're moving about they're still clustering and as you can see they're they're at the bottom but they have yolk sacs no food none whatsoever so I don't want to ruin the water quality here's another one batch same thing a different pair no difference but let's look at this batch this batch is much older it's actually nine days older and the transition at first is you will lose a few fry when they first start to eat but i'm expecting or i'm i i should expect maybe five percent so out of these these batches you can see what's five percent there's a couple hundred fry in here five percent you won't even notice but a few won't make it a few won't make that transition now what happens when you go from infusoria and then as soon as the infusoria I, I start integrating some vinegar eels for a couple days using both infusoria and vinegar eels and then when I think that they're big enough to start eating baby brine shrimp I start introducing the brine shrimp but that's the second stage when they really start to die off and there will be another five percent maybe maybe up to ten percent but usually closer to five percent so the five percent once they make it to baby brine shrimp you'll see and I, I noticed this I don't know why but let's say for example just looking back at this this batch right here um, these are all the ones that survived they started getting orange bellies because they started eating the shrimp but the ones that weren't eating the shrimp um, they were living but their stomachs were still small no orange and even though the shrimp was there I kept feeding them the other until they could transition but they never would transition so those are the ones that you find at the bottom dead and so like for example you'll see something like uh, that black spot there I don't think that's an actual uh, dead fish but that is actually what it kind of looks like you'll start seeing a few deaths but it's not much I'm expecting some to die I'm not expecting 100 percent um, success there's some mortality and that's because you want the weaker ones or the ones that aren't right or the ones that haven't developed you want them to not make it because you don't want to be babying them along all the way you want the strong healthy ones that's the way it is in nature if nature can do it that way uh, I can too so I'm not I'm just expecting certain ones oh and here's from last week I don't know if you saw these these I don't think we're swimming last week when uh, we, we looked at them these are all another group of electric blues can't get them in focus let me try backing up there we go there we go a beautiful batch of electric blues I'm really impressed with these I've had other batches and they kind of die off and that's something I just don't know if anybody's mentioned and I'd like to mention it because I want to become um, factual the facts are that sometimes a batch will look like this and just produce great other times they'll look like this and there's no difference in the way you're feeding them and I only have like what in this electric blue uh, batch what is it six seven there's not many fish left in there they've just not made it so it just depends on a lot of factors and I haven't figured out exactly why some would be uh, more or less that's the the problem why some do more and less I've also noticed that if I have a batch of eggs and and I'm breeding these eggs I'm hatching the eggs and, and if if all of them hatch and you're going to have a large group you're going to have large success I've noticed that if there's a small amount of hatching a small hatch rate or let's say for example there's fungus and only um, half the eggs come out and maybe another 
Um, one third of that remaining actually make it to the baby brine shrimp. For some reason, the German blues, or shall we just say the rams in general, doesn't necessarily mean German blues, for some reason they don't do well. They don't like to be just a few. They like to be in large batches. I don't know why that is, if there's some scientific reason why it could be that way, but let's see if I got caught up with all the questions. Good. Thank you all for uh, coming again. Looks like uh, S is with us and also uh, Malik. Thank you for joining today and being our moderator. That's awesome. Fishman64. Hi. Welcome. Another one. We appreciate you uh, stepping in today. So now, are there any more questions on the Paramecia? Please be sure to ask. We'll, we'll cover that again. Uh, I just think that it's important to know after you feed with Paramecia, remember it's the water quality. And remember that when you're pouring the, 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 the mixture in, it's, it's rotten water, right? They're so small, you can't filter them. It would be nice if, like baby run shrimp in the salt water. It would be nice if you could just, oh, okay, I'm going to just take out. And I don't know any way of doing that so, uh, efficiently. So what it means is you may have to um, keep alert on the water conditions. And I do that by, especially if there's a lot of fish in the, in the breeder box, like on this one, I'm going to change the water uh, regularly. If there's this many, or these, or these. Especially those. The moment I start putting the paramecia in there, I'm going to change up. Now, they're usually swimming at the bottom. It's very easy to change the water. Um, I want to show you this little tip. This is the tip of the week, you know, another um, easy way of doing water changes. Now, you ready for this? What I do is I use gravity and slowly change the water. So what I have and this is water bottle. This is an air stone on the end of airline tubing. This is a full tank of water. I put it above and just leave it higher than the rest. Now that's important because you grab, we're going to use gravity. So then what I do is I take the tank and we'll go ahead and I'm just going to demonstrate. I will use this particular one. I have a smaller hose. I'm not going to use a three quarter inch and suck out everything in two seconds. I will fish with it. I go with this, start into my sink and I start lowering the water. doesn't take long to fish at the bottom. I watch it very closely. I don't suck up any fish. Water's now dropped to 50%. This line here, as you can see, is dripping in. 50% airline hose. I know how long it's going to take to fill up four minutes. Now get this, I'm standing here and I, if I forget and there's fish, little fry swimming around, they're going to be flushed out and go down the drain because my drain is right down below them on the floor. So I need to know when four minutes is up. Now what I do is I say, Alexa, set timer for four minutes. Four minutes. Starting now. Did you hear that? Secret weapon of my fish room. If I don't do that, I will lose the fry. And uh, she confirmed that she set the timer, so and in four minutes uh, we're going to get a reminder. And I'm going to be able to change the fry. It's just going to be a slow drip. So the temperature of the room is the same. The water's been sitting here. For a while, it's the same temperature as the breeder boxes that are, or in this case, a critter container, critter box. And the water's the same, so it's just dripping in, and it's going to refill. 
And as soon as I hear the timer go off, I'm going to stop, stop the water. Now, I have a valve actually. This is an airline valve on this line. Right now it's full open. And to stop, I just turn it a quarter like that and I can stop the flow. Now that's that's my system. Now if you wanted to, you could take a container and you could pour water inside there and you would see all the fry go like woo 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 and it would be like bouncing around and some of them would probably hit the walls and they're very very susceptible to current, right? Uh, in this method, the current is low, they kind of they kind of kind of swirl up a little bit at times when the water hits them but I've found that it's no different than maybe the parents melding them moving them about it's not that much force so nonstop is asking about the temperature effects um, yes great question thank you so much for mentioning that for the paramecia I keep them now at the top of the fish room you can take them and keep them on the floor and it's cooler down there but I found that they do better in the slightly warmer temp so the room we look here here's my room temps uh, maximum you can see 80 was the maximum it got up to and 75 is the coolest it got down to in the last period of time and uh, we're at 62 percent it's getting humid the door is closed but this, uh, this basically tells me in my fish room at the moment that in the past few days it's never gotten more than 80. So um, at the top of the room it's probably just maybe 81 because the, the level of the thermostat is a little lower than the place where I keep my paramecia. So yeah, if you keep it in around 80 degrees, they, they thrive. Um, I believe, um, I, I forget what, uh, always forget what that is. Alexa, what is 80 degrees Fahrenheit in Celsius? Here's something I found on reference.com. 100 degrees Celsius is equal to 200 Oh, that's how to convert. convert Alexa, Celsius stop. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, I think it's 27 degrees, something like that, 26.7. But um, still getting used to the, uh, the, the new method of uh, temperature control. You'll see when you saw my... <laughs> yeah. I hope that answers your question. I know it did. So uh, I thought, let's see, how are we doing on time? Well, we're, we're about that time when... Uh, light effect. Hmm. Nonstop is asking about uh, the effect of lights. Um, I have not noticed any... Um, I have not experimented. Oh, the alarm is off. See, I already forgot. That's why. Alexa, stop. And that's why I need Alexa. Thank you, Alexa. I hope you, oh, I don't know if you heard that. What, what a thank you. Um, I think when somebody gets into something, it needs experience. Experience is the key. And when you start doing something, you're using my experience to jump in on it. And then after you jump in and into a certain process, you're going to work out the bugs and you're going to see what works best for you. So although, um, yeah, I may, I may certainly say something or do something that is uh, maybe got some, some helpful tips, but at the same time, maybe in your circumstances, your fish room, it might be different. You may have to ch test it out. So now I'd like to take a moment just to show you uh, something I promised to show you. We're going to look at a tank that's on the lower side, but because of the need, I've got it obviously on on uh, a heater. Here we go. Let's take a look here. 
there they are. It's a beautiful pair. A marble red male and uh, the female seems to also have some marble. You notice there's two sets of babies on her. Uh, this has been most interesting because um, she laid eggs uh, four days after I got them. The first batch I uh, had two babies survive and then they just dis disappeared. But uh, she laid eggs again before the babies were even gone, you know. So, in this particular case, she laid eggs a second time. And then while she had a couple fry on her, she laid eggs a third time. And what you're seeing are the fry from the second and third clutch of eggs. The first batch, I mean the, the, the older fry you see here are only six days older than the following fry so there's a total of what I can see or count probably maybe 26 fry in the tank right now so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep feeding them baby brine shrimp now they're starting to eat it and uh, there may come a time when I can remove them at the moment, they're still feeding off the parents, but at the same time eating baby brine shrimp. I also have a uh, special system for changing their water. They, um, I try to make it so that they do water changes daily. So I have uh, uh, water prepared here, clean, super clean water. And uh, you'll notice that there's a pump in there. So a pump and heater. So all I have to do is... Uh, uh, throw the throw the switch over here on the right and uh, it pumps water so I take a, a siphon and clean out their tank daily and um, boy what a gorgeous pair this has just been sensational for me it's uh, a first in my lifetime having discus and at the same time breeding them this is like too good to be true so I bought them as a um, breeding pair and uh, I got them and now I've been very pleased with them I think if you can get a an established breeding pair then that may be the way to go or you'll have to grow them up yourself and, and get one that's a breeding pair but I didn't have room to do that so that's why I never had them before but when this pair came available I uh, grabbed it because I felt like I would not get another second chance on that so that's what happened. Gorgeous fish. I really like them. So taking another quick quick look down the uh, fish room, I'm going to now surprise you all with uh, some new fish that I've not raised before, I've not bred. And they're in this breeder box. So let's see, anybody uh, have any ideas what these might be? Let's see. Uh, let's get over here and see if I can focus in on them. Okay. There's some muck on the bottom, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. There they are in the corner. Yep, they're catfish. And it looks like I have about 25 right now. And they're eating baby brine shrimp. I've got them on baby brine shrimp, so they're, they're doing well. These fry actually came out of this tank. Let's see if we can ca capture. It's very hard to see these these catfish, they don't, oh, there's one in the back, in the corner, they're usually in the corner, zipping back and forth. There they are. <laughs> yep, Synodonis, thank you, Aqua Malik. Yep, that's what those are, and they, uh, there's about 12 of them in there, males and females. So um, I, what I used was this bowl. You can see the one in there is a bowl and with a pot upside down and a hole in the back. 
I put the hole on the back side so they can go in and out with security or feel secure about it. And I just take uh, a base like this. And this is a piece of, um, this is cut out from the barbecue mash mesh that you order for barbecues heated. It's, it's an actual fiberglass. It's not metal. So it's, uh, there's no metal in it. So then I just take these marbles and I put in this bowl. And I really like the bowl because it's straight up and down on the sides, meaning that the fry inside, when they're first born, they tend to stick around. And so sometimes they'll hatch. I've pulled out of here mostly fry, not eggs. So far, I've not been able to capture the eggs. And um, when I do this, I take it out of the tank full of water. And I just pour it like here, like this, into the container. And lo and behold, voila, fry. Well, there's nothing in there now, but it gives you an example of what it was like when I first poured them out and looked in the container and I says, wow, amazing. These guys are really going to town. So I'm really excited about these. They'll probably take a long time to grow, but this will... An amazing um, weight because you see these kinds of fish I know aqua Malik or Malik will tell you when it comes to breeding zebras zebra plecos you have to wait till the fish mature my fish have been in my fish room for two years maybe longer over two years and uh, when I got them they were small so they're probably no less than three years old now and they're and they still got some growing to do but the fact is they have to be that old before they start breeding so now is the time when they're actually starting to breed and uh, so that's why sometimes I like to I like to get some young fry and then just put them in a tank and forget about them just take care of them well and and don't have high expectations and so and, and and that's that's kind of important to do don't don't have high high expectations because you need the fish to mature and to be old enough to, to breed and um, I hope that that this um, is a lesson because sometimes we get excited I want to get something bred I want to try something I'm expecting them I get them home from the store and and the next thing, you know, they're not old enough to breathe, and so why does it take so long? <laughs> it does take it does take time, but having them established and comfortable in your tanks for a year or two is uh, can be rewarding as well because uh, that breeding group is not going anywhere, and uh, they're gonna now they're going to be producing. I, I imagine that I'm going to have plenty of uh, fry to work with. So that's the joy of, of having a fish room, having something that takes a long time in preparation and, and um, getting it ready and for the moment when in actuality it, it now comes to it, com comes to fruition and you have something to show for it. That's really great. I want to check to make sure if there's any questions, uh, if there's Mm-hmm. I've got um, most of it uh, answered. That's great. 27.7. Thank you, Steve Sutton. If there's, uh, let's see, live feeding ASMR has joined us too. And his message is, do I turn off the light at night for my L46 zebras? Okay, I'm glad you answered that one, uh, Malik. Looks like we've done well. Now to give you, um, uh, this is an opportunity, if you have any questions, to ask them now. Also, um, um, uh, just to kind of highlight what's coming up. I want to um, mention something about microworms before I leave, only because we talked about the paramecium. Um, next week, uh, I think I'll mention uh, other live foods. 
um, micro worms, for example, and the baby brine shrimp. And um, I've got some, as you see, uh, quite a system going here with brine shrimp. And there's some things I've learned about it, some things that I think is, is important to keep in mind when, when doing it. And also, when it comes to microworms, microworms will go to the bottom of your water column, and vinegar eels will stay in your water column and go to the top because they have to get to the air to breathe from time to time. So they're always squiggling up to get to the top. That's something to bear in mind. And the brine shrimp only last in your water column for so long before the fresh water basically kills them because they're not in salt water any longer. Or they're maybe at the, the maximum length of time that they have since hatching. Now they're done way with, they finished their yolk sacs and now they need to start eating and they don't find food. So these are all factors to know how and the right way to use them. And so what we discussed today was the paramecia. Paramecia are good because they're in the water column and they will move around in the water column and they are also photosensitive so they will go towards the light. So it's another reason why when the German blues, after they hatch, these ones that we saw at the bottom of the container will start to rise. They will start to go to the top. And uh, for a few days they will just hang around in the surface tension of the corners and, and hug the surface of the water. Why that is, I don't know. They don't do that when they're being um, um, raised by their parents, but that's what they are. So that's the time I switch and I use vinegar eels along with the paramecia because I want the vinegar eels to go to the top and be right up with where the fish are so they can keep finding food. But in the case of the catfish, you may have noticed they're on the bottom and they're not typically swirling at the top. So microworms do better with them. But there are times when I do add a little bit of microworms to get them going. Now I would like to mention next week I'll get into depth because there's a right way and a wrong way to do microworms. And um, next week will be the last, probably the, the last, yeah, it'll be the very last uh, live show this year because 2022 is coming up so fast, I will not be um, doing anything on Christmas Day, but on New Year's Day, I probably will. So, but next week is not Christmas Day yet. Um, but I will, I will talk about some of these other live foods, and I will answer some of the questions here mentioned, like Ozzy's Offish. He wants to know about uh, culturing the microworms. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I have some tips on that too because the answer is I don't use oats. <laughs> I don't use oats. And uh, oats also gives a very strong smell. I use something else. And uh, I'll demonstrate that. Maybe we'll, we'll start a culture next week and um, it'll give you a good, a good feel for uh, how I do it. And also, I think the best way... I've seen a lot of people feed microworms to their fish and they always do this one way they take their finger and they swirl it and they put it in or they use some other device to get it off the sides of the container but what do you do when they're not on the sides of the container and what do you do if that much is too much so I'm going to talk about that so I got some great tips coming up next week and um, I really appreciate you all coming today spend an hour time's up I want to give everybody a great shout out thank you uh, be sure to give me a thumbs up if uh, you feel it was worth it. And also uh, be sure to tell others tell others about uh, the tips and, and the good things we have here in the Fish Easy Fish Room. And also, just to let everybody know, um, I'm open to uh, answering any questions you have. If you leave a comment below, even today, if you would like to comment on this particular live feed, I'll be posting it and I will respond to all comments and I will give you an answer. That's something I still can do because I'm just a little guy in a little fish room. Thank you 
and have a great day, a great weekend in your fish room. And this is Fish Easy signing off.